Okay, tonight it's Second Nephi, chapter 19. Nevertheless, the dinners shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards did more grievously afflict by the way of the Red Sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Okay, so what you have here is it's uh, describing the, the people as being in darkness. And, but it says, but the, the dimness is not going to be such as it was, because there's a great light coming, as you see in verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them has the light shined. All right now, who or what would that light be? Yeah, that would be the, that, would, that would be Christ. Okay, so it's, it's saying that Christ is coming, and in fact, coming through this uh, lineage that they were talking about. And in fact, in verse one, um, the, the land of, of Zebulon, right, is, is actually the area also known as, as Nazareth. Right, which is where Jesus grew up, right? and that the, uh, the land of, of Naphtali is, is the land near the Sea of Galilee. So these are actually lands in the, in the exact area where Jesus would, would be. So, uh, so you know, people familiar with the geography would then tie it together immediately as to who and what that's uh, referring to. Okay, so there's been darkness, but the, the light is coming. So not to, not to fear, if you will, because uh, Christ is coming. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. All right, so, says, thou hast multiplied the nation, and increased the joy. And now, you know, this is actually suitable for this time of the year, right? Because you can see really what it's referring to. We sing uh, one of our Christmas hymns is Joy to the World, right? And that's really, that's what it's referring to. You've increased the joy, right? The, because the joy is coming, that Christ is, is coming, right? So you, you can see that this chapter, well, 19 here, which refers to chapter 9 in Isaiah, is a chapter that talks about Christ, at least the first half of it, right? So... Uh, Really what it's talking about here in all these verses is the coming of Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of government and peace there is no end, upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, but verse 6 in particular, I'm sure you've heard that one uh, read before, right? because that, that one is read uh, in reference to, to Christ. Those are all names for Christ, all right? That, uh, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, right? When you see uh, articles about the names of Christ, the, the, all these names are always on it, and it comes from this, this verse. Right? In fact, we, we have a, a hymn that's in our... Levittown favorites that was in the country western book called His Name is Wonderful. <laughs> See, so that's that's where that com comes from. And, uh, so it's, that's what he's talking about here. And uh, brought to us a child is born and, and such. Now, one thing that I would point out um, is that, uh, you know, whereas 6 and 7 is talking about Christ, right, that, uh, you know, the part, of course, where a child is born and unto us a son is given would refer to the birth of Christ, as we would assume. Right, but with some of the rest of, of this, all right, it's talking about you know the increase of government and peace, there's no end and so forth. It's still talking about Christ, but it's talking about maybe what's going to happen in the future with Christ when he comes again. Right? Because you know, when he was here on earth, he wasn't, you know, people taking over the government and he wasn't really taking charge of, of the world at that time. He was here to show himself and appear and let people know who he was, and then, then he was crucified and, and resurrected. But then when he comes again, then it'll be the the mighty Christ coming here with, with the, the armies of angels to, to fight the, the battle and, you know, and, and he comes to basically side with his uh, followers. Right? So that's, that's really where the rest of, of this prophecy occurs. So it's, it's both. It's also talking about Christ, but some before and some after. The Lord sent his word unto Jacob and hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, 
The bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him, and join his enemies together, the Syrians before, and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Okay, so you know, one to seven, it talks about Christ, all right, now in the, in the rest, because it's going to talk about some um, challenges that, that the people have, or what we call the evils, all right, in fact, the, the, there's groups of like four verses each that talk about different evils that uh, the people were suffering, right, and that this is why Christ, one of the reasons why Christ had to come. Right now, from hearing verses eight to 12, if you were to pick out one evil, one problem, one concern, what would it be? What's, what's the Israel's problem as described in 8 through 12? Pride. Pride, exactly. Exactly. Okay, that's, that's their problem here, okay, is pride. Right? As, uh, as it is mentioned in 9, it's saying the pride and, and sounds of heart. And then it says, you know, hey, this didn't, you know, the bricks are falling down. That's okay, we'll, we'll rebuild it. You know, basically, we, we can handle it. We, we don't need God. We, we can handle it of our own strength. So it's, it's their pride that uh, was their, their downfall for that part. Okay, so that, that was one problem that they were dealing with. And uh, when it talks about the, uh, it says the Lord will set up the adversaries of Rezin against them. Who were Rezin, of course, was the king of, of Syria. All right, and... Uh, so that's why I show this page, because uh, when these names get mentioned, this way we can figure out who they are. But uh, the adversaries of Rezin, or of Rezin, <laughs> where it was, was Assyria, right? Uh, so Assyria was the enemy that these were trying to make a coalition about a couple chapters back to fight against that enemy, right? So basically saying that because of the pride of Israel, that God was going to bring the Assyrians against them, right? And that, in fact, that was in fact what happened. Okay, now, the, the uh, last thing I want to point out for this part is that even as, as God is speaking here through Isaiah, saying that uh, the Israelites are proud and, uh, and they're going to be punished and, and all this, yet, you see at the very end of 12, it says, for all this, is, it says his anger is not turned away, he's still he's angry, but his hand is stretched out still. Right? So, in other words, even though he may be angry at them, still he's there to pull them out as soon as they, they, they look to him. Right, so it's not that he's turned away from them, he's angry, and there'll be consequences, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore will the Lord cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men. I neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one of them is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So now if you're going to look at 13 to 17, all right, and now if you're going to pick out uh, one problem that uh, Israel had from the, these, this group of verses, what would that be? Misleading. Misleading. That's exactly right. Okay, that they, they had misguided leadership this time, all right, that the 16 leaders of this people caused them to err, all right, and, and they that led of them were destroyed, all right, so as, as you've heard us speak other times about, you know, if you follow somebody who's not going the right way, you're not going to get to where you want to go, all right, you, you're going to go the wrong way too, all right, so, such as those who, who follow cars into driveways and snowstorms and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and those kind of stories, all right, it's, uh, Right? You, you follow the wrong leader and you're just going to go the wrong way. Right? So that was their problem, right? Is that they had leaders that were not led, but led by God, and so therefore they were going the wrong, the wrong way. And so in 17, the Lord shall have no joy even in their young men because they're, they're not developing the right kind of leadership at, at that time. Right? So that, that was problem number two, or evil number two. And, and yet, what does it say at the end of 17? Says, it's his anger not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Right? So in spite of, of this problem, he's still uh, open to them if they would uh, straighten out and turn to him. For wickedness burneth at the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle in the thickest of the forests, and they shall mount up like the lifting of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, 
and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh Ephraim, and Ephraim Manasseh, they together shall be against Judah. For all this, his anchor is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. All right, so, uh, so what's problem number three now? Wickedness. And, uh, right, it says, for, for wickedness burneth as, as the fire. Okay, it's, uh, right, if you're going against God, then yeah, he's going to define that as being wicked. Now, I mean, it, you know, I suppose it's possible to say that somebody who is wicked by that definition they may not necessarily be, they may not necessarily be like evil or hurting anybody, but they're also not following the word of God. So therefore not going the way God wants you to, to go, and so therefore classified by God as being wicked. And so, and of course, a lot of wickedness is very evil, and so that's that's true too. Right? But you, you may remember a few weeks ago we read from the book of Omni here on a Sunday, the, the, the week where you know, we said those ones only wrote like three verses and for their whole life and they were done. Right? And, and the, the very first one, which was Omni, in fact, said, I'm, I'm, I've been a, a wicked man. Right? But yet he talked about how he was in the, in the military and fought for his country and so I think, well, it doesn't sound like a wicked man, but, but he was wicked in the sense that he did nothing, he had no relationship with God. Right? So that here he held the, the records for his whole life and didn't ever ruin anything on them because he had no relationship with God, so therefore he classified himself as a wicked, a wicked man. So, but anyway, but here it says, they, in this case, I mean, they were wicked, and they were wicked in, in the case of Israel here, that they were not doing what God wanted, they were not recognizing Christ, and then you see some of the things that it says here, right? That, uh, what does it say? Uh, 20, you shall snatch in the right hand, be hungry, even left hand, they shall be satisfied, they'll eat every man the flesh of his own arm. You know, so you, you see a, a definite wickedness going on here. Right, but now in 21, when it mentions Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, you have the two sons of, of Joseph, okay? And uh, so really the whole seed of Joseph comes from Ephraim and Manasseh, because they were the only two, two sons. So really, uh, anybody we would classify as seed of Joseph comes from one of those two. So if you put the two together, you got the whole, the whole seed of Joseph. All right, so it's saying that these together right, would, would be against Judah, and in particular, now it's you know it's talking over here, right? Because you got Judah is here, which was one of the tribes, and then the other ten were over here, right? And now it's saying they're really even Ephraim and Manasseh, where the the Joseph seed would be against Judah also, because they were just not following what God wanted them to do at this point, right? So so God was going to pit everybody against Judah because they were not following uh, His uh, precepts at this time. The Ephraim and Manasseh, as sons of Joseph, were when they divided up the land, that they were given their own shares of land as if they were at the same level as the rest of the sons of, of Jacob, right, or the, the rest of the tribes of Israel. So even though they were, in essence, half-tribes, because you know, they were both from Joseph, but they were, they were split up and they were each given their own uh, areas in, in Israel. So basically, the, the, the Lord is uh, focused on, on Judah at this time and in Jerusalem, and uh, so Isaiah's words are focused on, on that group. And, uh, but even though he's, uh, his anger is not turned away, his hand is stretched out still. So in spite of their wickedness, he's still willing to uh, receive their repentance and, uh, and forgive them, and his arm is stretched out still.